I, I love all this fellowshipping we get in. Well, hi to y'all. I hadn't seen you since last year. You must have went to Texas. It's good to see some of you that I have not seen since last year. Seeing you is a good way to start the new year. We're glad you're here, especially our visitors and guests, including Andrea and Helen. Tonight, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9. We're going to try to wind up Mark 9, be ready for 10, but that will be on hold uh, for uh, four weeks, four Wednesdays. And then, Lord willing, we'll be back starting on chapter 10, so we're going to take another little pause. Paul, since you're walking back that way, could you grab the mic and lead us in prayer? Oh, there it is. No, it's been grabbed. Well, let's begin with prayer tonight. Will you bow with me, please? Our dear, holy, heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us today. Father, we're thankful for the beautiful sunshine for the food that we had today, the warm clothing. Father, we're thankful for the building that we're in. And we have just so many blessings that you bestow upon us each day, Father. And Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are sick and restore their health. Be with those who are recovering from surgery and those who have surgery upcoming. Father, we pray especially for those who are fighting cancer. We pray that the treatments work as they're intended to work. And especially, Father, we ask your blessing be upon those who have lost loved ones. Father, be with us. Help us to walk in your path and to have your son's attitude of wanting to do your will above all else. And Father, may we be pleasing in your sight. And it's through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In Mark chapter 9, we've been looking at an event that occurred with relationship to the disciples of Jesus who were arguing among themselves. And do you remember what the question was at hand that prompted them to discuss? Who would be the greatest? And then Jesus is going to teach them a real lesson. And we've looked at that a little bit. We're going to broaden that a little bit tonight if we end up going to chapter 10. But verse 36, note in your Bibles there that it says that he took a little child. This is Jesus. Took a little child, set him in the midst of them. What is there about a little child that is so wonderful? Innocent. What else? Total dependence upon someone else. Do they have a, a natural joy about them? I have been getting a, 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 just a, a real joy out of watching uh, Scott and Diane's grandson, granddaughter, excuse me. 
And she sits right there, and she's in tune with everything going on, right? And she's smiling, and she's moving her hands when the songs are being sung, and and just just amazing. I just can't wait to hear her first say, Amen, when I'm preaching. But she's a delight. And, 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 and your children were that way too, right? Most of the time. Do children ever become an irritation? Yeah. We love them to death, but there are times that, that we need a vacation, right? At least for a few minutes. I remember Kathy saying something like this, not one more time. Give me just a few minutes, please. As much as we love our children, there are times that, that they can be challenging. But Jesus notes something about a child is very important to teach this lesson. He put, set that child in, in the midst of his disciples. And when he had taken him in his arms, so that tells us where was Jesus and his disciples. And where were they at? They're with each other, right? He took a child, a little child, set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them. So they're all in close proximity. If we go to Mark chapter 10, we're going to jump over there, uh, get a little bit ahead here. We read it in this account at this time, that they brought little children to him. If you'll notice there in Mark 9, 36, he took a little child. In Mark 10, we have children. And they brought little children to him that he might touch them. Why do you suppose people wanted Jesus to touch their children? Somebody help us out here. Blessings? Could we possibly be healing? Anybody know uh, of a parallel account that might have given us some inter- information? Well, just, just consider that. They brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples. Now, who were the ones arguing about who's going to be the greatest? The disciples. Yeah, but disciples rebuked those who brought them. Why did they do that? Can children be an irritation? Can adults perceive that children have no place in adult conversation or adult activities? And I don't mean anything other than adults participate. Possibly. Do the disciples see the it's the the nature of the children as they should have. Kathy? What they were doing with Jesus was too important to be interrupted. There you go. I mean, they're arguing about and they're concerned about Jesus and the kingdom and the greatest position, how to be there, um, lots of things. So they obviously, in the, using the word Scripture does in chapter 10, rebuke, that would mean what? Scolded, yeah. And Verse 14, Jesus responds. And how did he respond? He was displeased. Jesus saw it. He was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. And there's a significant reason we see in this passage of Scripture. And what is it? And this is beautiful. For of such is what? The kingdom of God. What did that do about blowing the disciples out of the water, so to speak, with reference to their view of where they needed to be in the kingdom? And you think about this. They're displeased because here comes the kids, and you know what the kids do? They've got no place around adults that... They're not going to be a part of a discussion of the kingdom, are they? Could they be an irritation, possibly? Could they be asking questions that don't need to be talked about? You know, kids are full of little questions. They only have to use a three-letter word. Why? You all know about that. We've mentioned it before. Why? That's all they have to do. 
so when Jesus said, for such is the kingdom of God, that must have been a shock to the disciples. Why do you think it was a shock if that were to be true? And I believe it is. and the joy and the pure happiness of a child. Um, this is such the kingdom of God. I mean, this is what he wants everyone, all of these adults who think they know so much and are so wise and full of wisdom that, you know, no, I want you to have the mind and the heart of a child. Very good. And, and have you noticed that when you're around children that are young, we got a, and I've got a niece, my brother Eric, she's seen her here, she's a little six-year-old. She just loves kids. She comes from Vietnam. She learned to speak English there, which she does really well with. But the change in culture doesn't bother her. When she sees a group of kids, let's go play. And you notice other children like that? There's some that are kind of quiet and don't do that, but a lot of kids just love. Well, speaking of, tell me her name again. Zula, so I'll get it right. Speaking of Zula, look at her, her and Larry. They have a natural curiosity. They love to play. They love to participate. And there's such a beautiful innocence about them. And are they seeking greatness? Have y'all noticed Zula wanting to be great? Have you ever heard her arguing about place and position of greatness? No. Very good point, by the way, Andrea. For such is the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things that can be said about the nature of a child. Anybody want to add something in reference to the nature of the child? Awe and, and wonder? Awe and wonder of things. They, they, it's a, it's a whole magic, it's a whole huge world, and they just want to take it all in. And a couple with that, they got a mind, a brain, for the most part, that says, knowledge, knowledge, teach me, teach me. One of the problems the disciples had is they were in a position that it made it difficult to teach them why. Yeah, their brains were muddied with self-interest, selfishness. All that the adults know, so they're not, they don't have all the preconceived notions or stuff that's already been, you know, they're like, the best I, way I can say it is your brain not being muddied up. Yeah, very you know, good. With all of the cares of the world. Very good. But Jesus was greatly displeased at their, their attitude um, and towards those children in, in chapter 10. And note in verse 15 what Jesus said. Surely I say to you, whoever does not what? Receive the kingdom of God as a little child, will by no means enter it. So what was Jesus wanting from them, the disciples, that was like a little child in order for them to enter the kingdom? Humility is a big one. We'll see. Somebody else said something? Acceptance of... Christ? Yeah, and children, are, as they age too, particularly, if you speak to them, and, and let's suppose that they're doing something that could cause them harm, and you as a parent say, or as an instructor or teacher or whatever, if you say, don't do that because you're going to hurt yourself, will they buy that? Children, too, are forgiving, and they don't hold grudges. There you go, good one. And they don't argue about anything that's negative. Yes. They press forward. And they're teachable. They want to learn. They want to learn. And uh, that's important because sometimes it's difficult for the disciples to, to, to really hear what Jesus is saying, as it is uh, adults, as I'm referencing me. Uh, sometimes my ears aren't as open as they should be. Well, verse 16, what does Jesus do? Beautiful passage. He took them, and it's the plural, isn't it? 
he took them up in his arms. Have we read those words before? What was it in chapter 9? If you go back to chapter 9, he took a little child and set them in set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken them in his arms. What is there about this taking them up into his arms? What is that telling us? Luke has recorded it twice. Love. Did Jesus accept them? You have an acceptance on Jesus' part, but what about on their part? If I were to go over here and try to get Zulu, you think she'd come come to me? She might. But she would much prefer somebody like Scott, wouldn't she? I hear she's going for Grandma right now. I'm glad we have this object lesson tonight. Perfect. And you notice what Diane did? That was a great illustration. Did you see what she did? Y'all were looking? Zula wants Grandma. And so when Grandma gets her, what's Grandma do? Hugs her tight. Love is shown, displayed, acceptance. And also, what about care and concern? Protection, comfort, all those things that go involved with that, just, which is probably list a bunch of them. But there is a lot said, and I think it's significant that Luke uses that tells us that twice, can it? I mean, uh, Phyllis? Well, they've just gone through non-acceptance by the disciples because they were trying to keep them away from him. And he is reinforcing that acceptance to them that, you know, not all adults are going to be like that. You know. And, That's a good point. In fact, you almost see the disciples going, oh boy, what's he doing? Obviously, they... they they were struggling, I'm sure, when they saw this happen again. And so he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and what did he do? Remember what we mentioned before? Somebody said it. Bless them. I don't know all the ramifications, if we can identify that. Does anybody want to try? How many of us would like to be there? What's good news about when we leave this world? We will be there. We're going to be in the presence of God, and we'll know fully the blessings. Well, of course, God blesses us here, but and, and we know that He is concerned about us, that He cares for us, because we're called the children of who? God. Took him up in His arms, laid His hands on them. If we go to Matthew 18, Matthew gives us insight that kind of puts it all together. In verse 2 of Matthew 18, we read, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted. And so Matthew records these words in expansion of what we've already seen in Mark. Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. What does this word convert mean? It's a turning around. From it's a turning around, a conversion process. And so that's making a change of direction. Does it involve a change of heart and mind? Yes. We... We would classify it as repentance, right? What is repentance? Making a change. Is it easy to do? If I have a sin problem and I need to repent, why can that be sometimes difficult? You think Would of you a, say that again so everybody can hear you? I think there's a big emphasis on the fact that it says little children in all of these verses that have been brought up. It doesn't just say children, but it says little children, and I think there's a big emphasis on little because the smaller children are, are just born with that faith. That unless, 
unless it's been broken, they automatically trust. They automatically um, know that the, the adults in their life are going to care for them and protect them and take care of them. They don't know anything else um, until you, they, you, you get older and you start learning, you know, the hardships of life and all of that. And then and as an adult, it becomes harder for us to, to convert back to that small child. But Jesus is trying to emphasize how important it is for us to, to turn back to that and to convert back to... And so if we can reflect on that. If we can look at little children and we can see, you know, what we see in little children, maybe that can help us, yeah. you know, to say, oh, well, this is what I need to be more like. You just watch a small child, how they're so, for, they, they don't fear anything. They walk off the edge of a, 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 a bench or whatever and don't realize they're going to fall and, and bust their head or that they're going to touch fire and it's going to hurt them. Or they just automatically, like, you know, know that grandma's going to love them and, you know. <laughs> And, and that's what Jesus is trying to emphasize. That's, I think that's the reason why he says little children. There's that, there's that innocence. You get your mic there. Um, in both of the scriptures we've had thus far, it seems like, um, well, it doesn't seem like it, it, it is, that Christ has an opportunity to teach something and he sees an opportunity and to teach something about the Father in Heaven and when the children are are turned away well he's, he's in, in that inci- incident he's, he's telling everybody that, that he puts his arms around him that's the way our Father is reacting to us as, as his children and when you talk about uh, the conversion, adults have to actually change their way because they can unlearn a lot of things that they've learned. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's a conversion, a reverting back to the attitude of a child where the child is curious about the world, wants to learn, wants to, to, to find out what's going on. And if he uh, gets said the right things rather than the wrong things, he'll grow spiritually as well as, as physically as into adulthood. And that's basically what I wanted to say. Excellent comment. That, very good, Charlotte. That's well said. You look at Zula, she has something in common with Jesus. And so does every other little child. We speak of it as what? Innocent of sin. Look at that. She's happy about that. And the beauty of that is that someone said, I, I, I heard a preacher mention this, I believe it was, a preacher, just somebody talking about it. Jesus is good as it gets, right? Now, what's going to happen to Zula? She's going to be around Seth. <laughs> and what happens to the innocence of children? Andrea? What happens to the innocence of children as they grow older? They start losing that and become accountable for sin. It's not that you're a sinner, Seth. But one day, he, like all of us, will struggle with doing those things right. But it's interesting reference to the kingdom, which we know is the church, that there is a conversion that we need to go through in order to enter into the kingdom, and that is become like little children. And the ultimate innocence that we will have will be when? When we come out of that watery grave, we're going to be... Innocent of what? Yeah, they're washed away. And then I'd like to say, we'll never sin again. Some people believe that. When they're baptized, I'll never sin again. I wish I could say that. But that's not the promise. Is The promise is we will sin. But there is also another promise. What's that, Dan? First John 1, 7. That the blood will continually purify and cleanse as long as what? Yeah, 
is like, as long as we're like little children. And is that a challenge for us? Oh, yeah. And also, as we see this follow in verse 4, therefore, and there's a therefore, what's a therefore indicate? A conclusion. Therefore, whoever does what? Humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Did that sit in the disciples' lap? Remember, what were they conversing about? What were they talking about? Who's going to be the greatest? What they didn't see was who is really the greatest. And who's the greatest? The person who can what? And what does humble mean in this context? Whoever humbles himself. What happens to us as we get older from that little child? Where's our humility? That's the one thing that we have to work on all the time. You know, so in order, in order to be like that little child who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It, that, it, that's it's a big issue. Do we ever reach the point that no problem? That we're We've reached the point of humility. Now it's no problem. Well, wasn't there a song something like that about being humble? Humility, though, is not... Huh. That's it. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect. The only way we can reach perfection is how? In this life, through Christ. Luther, you were saying something. Humility, though, is not praise. It is not rewarded. It is chastised and it's kicked aside. If you want to do something or be better in this life, then you have to sing your own praises. So humility is not something you can show. It's not something you can practice. Otherwise, you're going to be overlooked for everything in every major job that you ever have. In a secular world. But one of the problems disciples had is... is um, their selfish ambition within the kingdom. And humility would require them, and, and, and Matthew used it, but we've looked at the accounts in, in Mark, their references, if, if they were going to be great, what did they have to do? And this is where humility comes in. To become a servant. I watched the lady I worked with, if she, ever, if she saw a mess, she didn't say anything to anybody, but she'd clean it up. And I've seen people here in the congregation, if something happens, there's a mess made somewhere, where are they at? Whether it's in the bathroom, the kitchen, wherever. They're willing to do what? Clean up, get their hands dirty. And if they need to help somebody, what are they willing to do? Help somebody. The key to greatness is service. Becoming like that little child, willing to serve others by uh, in a sense of humility, not seeking greatness, not seeking a reward for it. And it's just a beautiful picture. Back to Mark 9, I want to move on here before time runs out. Uh, I didn't share this with you last time, but I want to tonight. When we look at verse 37, there's some keys to the word receive. Jesus said, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So he's saying the Father. Now, the first word is different. The first receive is different from the rest. The rest are present active, meaning they're in present tense, and, and uh, at any point in time they'll remain there. So they, it's, it's a continuous present tense. But the word that's used in the first usage where Jesus says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me is different. In fact, Dan, you have the King James. Would you read verse 37? Where do you get the mic there, Dan? Thank you. Whosoever shall receive one, uh, sorry, one su of such children in my name receives me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. 
You'll notice there it uses the word shall receive. Whoever shall receive one of these little children. And that's a good translation for the first one. And it's okay on the rest because it's still present active. But this word is an aorist subjective middle. Aorist means what, English teachers? Normally it would be past tense, right? Something's in the aorist case. Clayton, second if you had Kathy, you write it with me on this. Okay. So that normally would reference a, a past tense. But what we have here is part of this word is, is the fact it's a subjective middle, and don't ask me to explain all that other than what I'm going to share with you that I've wrote down. The subjective mood in the original language refers to an event, which can be a hypothetical event, although it is an event that can occur. And it's in reference in what will or can occur, hypothetically, in the future. Now, what is important about that? Who is the only one receiving children at this point? What were the others doing? They were rebuking. What are these children doing here? And so that's why I, I, I think it's significant to know because Jesus is actually telling them something. Whoever shall receive, or in looking towards the future, one of these little ones, in my name, what is Jesus saying? He's going to be receiving me. Whoever is going to be receiving me receives not me, but him who sent me. You see the difference? What is Jesus saying to them? He's saying, you ain't doing it now. But what would they do? Would they receive him? Yes, yeah, they would. And that's what he's stressing them. He says, you're going to, you're going to understand this. Now, right now, we know they're having struggles with this, right? But they will reach a point, except for poor old Judas, you know. He, he got hung out to dry. Y'all supposed to smile with that. I worked hard remembering to say that. So whoever receives, and that's something that's going to happen, is going to receive me. It won't happen. You won't receive me until they do what? What? Yeah. But they, they're, they're not going to receive Jesus until they're willing to do what? Receive one of these little children. And if that occurs, they receive the children. And of course, what is he talking about? He's talking about that very nature of the child, isn't he? Becoming like the child, the conversion process. Until they reach that point, they're not going to receive him. They're not going to receive who else? The Father. So this process had to be in place. And, and we would see it happen. Because their lives would be what? Humble to the point of willing to serve others. And so just a bit of tidbit. Um, there's a little bit about what that word means. To receive favor, to give ear to, embrace, take, to make one's own approve, not to reject. And that's something the disciples would do. And that brings us just the last few minutes I want to look at in Mark 9, verse 41. But whoever gives a cup of cold water, drink in my name, that person is a servant, right? And, and they do so because you belong to who? Christ. Disciples would fully understand that as time would go on. But he also is with that gives us a promise, and I love the promise. I say to you, he who by he will by no means lose what? His reward. Is there a reward for those who humble themselves and serve? First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Randy, you quoted it last week. We'll go ahead and hit it again. Steadfast and movable always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor's not in vain in the Lord. That means something. No means lose reward. But then there's a shift in verse forty two. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, he's got a problem, right? It would be better for him to, if something happened, what would that be? And what is a millstone, Terry? And they come in all kinds of heavy weights, right? 
And you don't find a small one of those, do you, Dale? Not very often. Mill stung her at and would drown in the sea. And so then he goes on, if your hand causes you to sin, do what with it? Cut it off. What's he saying to, to his disciples? He's saying there's priority. Because what's going to happen if a person doesn't repent and become like a little child? It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to go to hell. I've been told to do that by several people in the past. They didn't have what Jesus had in mind. What's Jesus have in mind? Fire. Yeah, there we go. He says, a fire that shall never be quenched. We'll talk about that in a minute. In verse 47, he goes on. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with what? One eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into, there's a word, hellfire. Uh, the original word is Gehenna. Now, here's the question. What does Jesus mean? What's he saying? He wants us to physically pluck eyes out. He'd give the medical industry a lot of business. It's not what he wants. He doesn't want cut off hands. He doesn't want our eyes plucked out. But he's wanting something from us. Could we say he's wanting us to become like little children? It's causing you sin. And we, you all, you, the Bible class teachers, you, you've taught your kids that. They like the story, don't they? It's like those little ones that go, reach over and try to pluck somebody else's eyes, eyes out for them. Not a good thing in a Bible class, of course. Terry? Yeah, basically what everybody else is saying, too, whatever is a sin problem to you, you've got to get away from that sin problem and so you can serve God in an appropriate manner. You can't straddle a fence, so you've got to get away from the sin problem. And that is what that re repentance, conversion process is about, isn't it? And is it a challenge? It sounds easy, but is it? It's a struggle. But we've got motivation, right? What in the world is this hell fire about? Well, Jesus explains both in verse 44 and verse 48. Where what doesn't die? The worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Is there such thing as eternal hell fire? Jesus said there was. If he said it, we're going to what? Can this be motivation for us? Chris, you burned yourself today, didn't you? What did I say? There you go. Every time I burn myself, or uh, I, I'll say that to myself. Now you know you know where you don't want to be. Well, where does this word come from that we see used here for the word hell? You'll see there I've got down to the bottom of the footnote that you have in the King, New King James Bible. It says Gehenna. Does anybody recall what Gehenna is? Trash, valley, or pit. It's a ver it's burning. continuously burning because I can continuously through the trash there. And the smell and the stench and the heat from the vat, from that continuous burning garbage dump. Mm -hmm. But all the Jews knew what that was. And the worms don't die. And the fire doesn't what? Go out. And this, if you go back to the Old Testament, you learn more about this. Um, uh, if we had time, we'd read Jeremiah 7. 31, 19 through 26. If somebody wanted to go there real quick, it might pay us to do it. Um, but it's in reference to the Valley of Hinnon, outside of the walls of Jerusalem, and it was a garbage dump, but it became famous for what reason? You recall, Paul? Burned constantly, and it was there that children were what? Offered a mower. Children. Can you imagine? Taking a small little child like Zula or any other little child that's innocent and passing that child through the fire as offering to an idol. What is wrong with people? How horrible. And yet they were offered there and burned in the fire. 
outside of the city, here in Jerusalem. Uh, somebody got Jeremiah 7? Wouldn't want to read it? It's okay if you don't. We'll move on. Uh, but you might want to go back and read Jeremiah 7, 19 2 through 6. With reference to hell, sometimes we think when a person dies and they're ready to meet God, that we call it, talk about how they're in heaven. And we kind of forget a little bit about the Hadean world, which is the world of paradise and Tartarus. Probably most of you are familiar with that. If you're not, I'd be glad to, to offer some scriptures for you to read. But we saw the La- Lazarus, who was, he died and was in rich, Abraham's bosom. Once again, that picture of comfort and arms. Uh, then there was the, the rich man. He was in torments, or that word is Tartarus. And what was between them so that they couldn't pass one way or the other? Great golf. But then there's coming a resurrection from the grave of the Hadean world. And what's going to happen in Matthew 25? What's going to happen, Terry? Judgment Day. We're going to face judgment. And then we're going to hear the pronunciation of judgment. Of course, John 5, all their graves are going to hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good, it's the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil, resurrection of damnation. And interestingly enough, where does most people think they're going, even though they never darken the door of any church building? Everybody's going to heaven because nobody wants to think about the alternative. And those who do, oftentimes, I, I don't believe that. There's even... Uh, denominational religions that teach there is no such thing as hell. That's a fiction, mythical interpretation. It doesn't exist. Well, that's a good way to, to escape it, but is that going to change it? No, no, that's, this is it. And it's going to be a place where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. And it's not going to be escapable, is it? Do some religions teach that after a while you can kind of get out of torment? Purgatory, yes. Yeah. That's not the way it's going to be. Notice what we read in Matthew 25, verse 46. These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous where? Eternal life. Larry? Do you think that this building would be full if people comprehended this? The big thing is going to be absence of God. On earth, you don't have absence of God. In heaven, we'll be within the light of the, of the Lord. And in hell... It was made for Satan and his angels, not made for the children of God. God, we, what will be the biggest moment will be absent of the Father. And we're going to know that. You will have knowledge of that. And there's nothing, the, the biggest torment is going to be that you are separated from the Father. Very good. And good way. don't think about that. It's outer darkness, isn't it? But I, I think about what, how, could, if people believe that, would they want to change their lives? But then again, when you look at all the rewards of heaven, how many people are motivated by that? I hope you are tonight, which I know you are. But it's the reward and it's the what? The punishment. Did that occur, Randy, in the Old Testament? In the warning of of Deuteronomy 28, 29, is that right? Uh, you have the blessings and you have cursing. And God has made that clear. 
Uh, real quick before we end, um, Jesus talks to the disciples. Uh, we'll just save that for later. I want to spend a little more time with that. So, because we're done, aren't we? With the uh, bells, is that correct? So, I appreciate your attention tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your comments and, and thoughts. It, it helps us all in our understanding and study of Scripture.
Good evening. Has anybody seen Kevin Burnham? Kevin's supposed to be here. Where's Rick at? Do you have any announcements? Because if Kevin's not here, unless somebody's got announcements. Dean's home, that's great news. Fellowship dinner Sunday. Prayers, anybody? Roy, Deborah. Well, that's great. That is super. Jacob's on the way home. Wow. That two out of three? Good deal. Anything else? Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to gather, Father, to study your word and sing songs of praise to you, Father, to give you the honor and glory that you so richly deserve. Father, we're thankful for these men and being able to come home safely and pray that you'll be at the other soldiers that's around the world that serve in this country. Father, we're mindful of Dean being able to come home and pray that he can continue his healing. We're mindful of Roy and those others, Father, that have tests pending and and Father we pray that that your healing hands will be upon them. Most importantly, Father, we're mindful of those that may be spiritually lost and help us to serve you by sowing the seed or watering that you might give the increase. Father, we know we sin and fall short of your glory at times and we ask forgiveness, strength not to repeat our sins. Strive to be forgiving of others. Ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize. I didn't know I had it hanging. So, but we still have it up on the board because I sang it two weeks ago. Hey, I hope you have this one again. I'll put it up here. Is that better? We need that. We could sing about birds. We're going to sing, uh, if you want to mark 417, if you're using the book, but it should be up there. And yes, it was two weeks ago, but it was last year. So, and, they, and they're good songs. First, last verses of Redeemed, okay? That's 514, <clears throat> 514. And then 417 be the song of invitation. Redeemed how I love to proclaim hope that's better. Um, if you want to, uh, first verse that we'll go to tonight is uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. Uh, Genesis 6, 22. 
is where we'll start. Um, but when I saw that I had this devotional, I, uh, those of you that don't know, I, I'm in business and, and uh, blessed to oversee and, and lead a lot of people. And, and one of the traits that my team says I'm really good at is delegation. So, uh, and my kids can attest to that as well. And as I prepared for this devotional, I delegated. I, so I said, Molly, what would you like me to do a devotional on? And she was real quick, and she said, Noah's Ark. It's like, all right. And so uh, I thought, well, that's a good idea. But then I went a step further as a good delegator, and I said, well, I want you to tell me why, and I want you to send me some things that you take away from, some, from Noah's Ark. And unfortunately, she's not here tonight, but she did. So um, you can, we can learn a lot from, obviously, the story of Noah. And, um, but what I'll do is I'll have some verses and, and really one key takeaway that she shared with me and then one that um, I actually did some work as well and, and came up with my, on my own. But as I was also preparing for this, it made me pause and reflect and think back on when Dr. Brad Harib was here and um, when he spoke about the ark. And um, that was one of those lessons I, I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, I pray I don't forget. Uh, as I get older, I, I pray, hey, I hope I don't forget that. But, um, you know, his take on that was very different than what, um, you know, as he referenced what we learn in Bible class and, and all the good things about the ark. And he really laid it out on really what transpired and what happened and uh, the tragedy uh, for so many people. And so it, it, it made me reflect on, on that lesson as well, and, and just uh, just the remembrance of how impactful that that lesson was. But in Genesis six twenty two, this was uh, this was the verse that Molly uh, picked out. But it says Noah did this; he did all that God commanded him. So he did. And so within this, um, there's a three letter word there that Terry and I, when we teach the high school kids on Sunday morning. We always tease Terry, it's his favorite word, the all. So thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And Molly's lesson that she wrote, and I'll, and, and I'll quote, she said, Believing in God can help you through life. Without God, you will fail. God has great power. And so this is from a you know, 12-year-old a child. We talked about child in, in Rick's class out here. And... You know, that was her words, that believing in God can help you through life. Without God, you will fail. And God has great power. So I think about, you know, Noah and having that relationship with, with God and, um, and how he did do those commandments and how we today, we have that same opportunity that if we will do all that God commanded us, that, you know, we will be saved as Noah and his family was, and uh, again, that was, that was a key takeaway that she shared. If you go over to uh, just the next chapter, um, chapter 7, verse 1, then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And so, again, we have that opportunity to do all that God commands, and I would hope that he would look at us as as righteous as well. And one thing that I thought about was, really, if you go on down to, to verse 23 there in chapter 7, stay in there. Um, this is where I did some work. Um, he says, So he, God, destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things and birds of the air, or bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with them in the ark remained alive. And we know that there were eight souls. And I did some study, and I, I couldn't find, uh, maybe Rick or, or Paul or others might have the, the number, but I don't know if that the Bible states how many people were on the earth at that time. I, I think I read, like, maybe there's ten generations up to there, and there were some guesstimates of a billion. You know, I, I don't know. But I think it's safe to say there was... A lot more than eight. And when you think about only eight being saved, and then I think about what Dr. Brad Arab talked about and, and just those on the outside and how he portrayed that, 
Uh, that's scary. And then as Rick was finishing his lesson tonight, it, it brought me back to my point as well. If you want to turn to uh, Matthew, Matthew seven thirteen, Matthew seven thirteen. So my key takeaway is the fact that, you know, they say history repeats itself. And in those days, eight souls were saved. And as Rick was mentioning and closing up tonight, there's people that don't believe that there is eternal punishment and that we're all going to heaven. And though that thought sounds great, it's just not accurate according to, to God's word. And when I think about in Genesis 7:23, and I think about those eight souls, and I think about in Matthew, Jesus himself saying, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Continuing in 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And that's our Lord and Savior, Savior telling us this. And if you drop down to verse 21, Alan and I, when we stayed together in jail, we use this one quite often. And I'm sure that we all have those verses that um, get our attention. Um, this one gets my attention, and uh, not that all of them don't, but then in verse 21, I'll read 21 through 23, again, Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so when I think about Noah's Ark and I think about Molly's takeaways, you know, to do all that God commands us, believing in God, that he can help you through life, and has great power. I also think about the side of you know, only a few were saved during that horrific event. And according to Jesus here in Matthew, that's going to be the case when Jesus comes back as well. And so that's my lesson on Noah's Ark. I know there's a lot that we can learn from the story. But those are the two things I want to share with you tonight. If you're here and you haven't put on Christ in baptism, we implore that you would do so. Before it's eternally too late, if you're here and you have and, and you're struggling, um, pray that you'd come forward as we stand and sing so that we could help you with any need that you have.
Father, please. Our Father, what a, a wonderful way to end the day that you've given us. So thankful, Father, for the opportunity, the privilege to serve you, and especially, Father, midweek to be able to study together and then, Father, to hear your word so perfectly proclaimed. So thankful, Father, for the difference that Jesus has made in the lives of each one of your children. We do pray you'll help us that we might continue to perfect those lives that you've given us, that we might be able, Father, to become all that you want us to become before we're called home. We realize, Father, that we live in a world that is lost. We realize that Satan is an individual, that an entity that has power. We realize, Father, that you overcome him and you did overcome the world. And as a result of that, we likewise can do the same. Help us, Father, that we might study, that we might make proper application to our lives in order, Father, we might be more effective in our service to you. Father, we're mindful of the avenue of prayer you have given to us. We appreciate that so very much. And Father, there are those that we would lay before you this evening before we depart. Thankful, Father, that Roy was able to get in and get his uh, testing done. We pray, Father, that the results of that will, will be good. They'll be able to determine what the proper uh, follow-up needs to be. We pray, Father, you'll bless both him and uh, his wife as they deal with the situation. Father, we also would ask your blessing upon, I know Sister Pat will be having her surgery coming up. We would ask, Father, that that surgery will go well. And Dennis will be having surgery before long on his shoulder. And we pray, Father, that likewise will, will go well. Father, for those that have got uh, good results from the testing, we rejoice with them. For those, Father, that are following up, um, we would ask, Father, as they continue um, their treatments and their therapies, that, Father, the good will result from that. We ask, Father, your blessing upon our nation. We pray you'll always remind us, though, Father, that this is not our home. Help us not to fall in love with uh, the world or the things that are, are in the world. But help us, Heavenly Father, to, to love you and to love your Son. And that we might show that in returning our love to you and in sharing that love with those that are around us. Father, we're mindful of Rick and Kathy and Terry and Ruth as they'll be leaving for Panama. Uh, this next week, we would ask, Father, for safety for them as they travel both ways. We would ask, Father, as teaching is done there, both to the wives of the teachers as well as the uh, preacher students, we would ask, Father, that good would result from that, that school will continue to educate and send out men that are qualified and men that will remain faithful to you. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the love that you show us on a daily basis. We humbly ask this through our Savior Jesus. Amen.